I wish to read for you some verses from Paul's letter to the Philippians. The words are Paul's, to be sure, but much more to the point. They are the Word of God. But whatever it was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. May God bless to us the reading and the hearing of this portion of His holy word. Pray with me, please. Give me Jesus, Lord. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Amen. Uh, I don't quite know if I should tell this little joke or not. <laughs> eh, I've been here for a year and a quarter now, and you haven't run me off yet. So maybe I'll take a chance. Ha, it's the story of a little boy pulling a wagon along a sidewalk. The sidewalk runs in front of the preacher's house, and the preacher's sitting on the front porch. Right at that point, a little boy arrives pulling the wagon suddenly, a wheel falls off the wagon and begins to roll downhill. The little boy immediately cries out, I'll be damned. The preacher cries out, Son, you need to clean up your language. That's enough speaking like that. The little boy agreed to try to do better. Next day, same thing happens in the same place. The preacher's on the front porch. The little boy's pulling the wagon. Suddenly, the wheel falls off the wagon starts to roll down the hill, the little boy, without even thinking, says, I'll be damned. The preacher jumps up, charges out to the sidewalk, and he says, now, son, I need to clean you up. You need to do something better with your life. You are going to have to speak correctly. So whenever something goes wrong, when the wagon wheel falls off, you need to cry out, praise the Lord. You'll be amazed at how much better that will be for you. The little boy promised to try. The next day, the little boy's pulling the wagon along the sidewalk. The preacher's on the front porch. The wagon comes off, the wheel comes off the wagon, starts to roll down the hill. The little boy looks a sidelong glance at the preacher and says, Praise the Lord! The wheel stops rolling downhill, turns around, starts rolling back up the hill, <laughs> rolls right over to the axle on the wagon, and reattaches itself. And the preacher says, I'll be damned. <laughs> Phew. 
Well, it was a chance I took. I... <laughs> but you know, the fact of the matter is, God indeed does do some dramatic things in this world. Yes. And God has done some dramatic things in this church. Here, God has pulled together a great company of people who are committed to Jesus Christ and committed to loving one another in Jesus Christ and committed to serving Jesus Christ in the world. God has called together a great company of His people who are serious about discerning God's will and pursuing that will with everything they have and everything they are. God here has called together this great company of people who are determined by the power of Christ to transform the city, the nation, and the world about. This church's history has been marked by glory and greatness. And yet, if I were to try to characterize what I would pray would be the spirit of this congregation right at this very critical point in our church's life, I would borrow the magnificent words Paul wrote to the Philippians. Paul reached down deep in his heart and he cried, This one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus my Lord. Oh, yes. I would like today to take those forward-thinking, forward-looking, forward-acting words of Paul and apply them to us as believing Christians and to us as a believing church. And on the basis of Paul's words, I want to suggest to you that for us, the best is yet to come. In the first place, the best is yet to come for us as believing Christians. Listen again to Paul. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. I want you to focus, please, on those words, becoming like Him in His death. Paul was desiring to become like Christ in his sacrificial love and service. He was desiring to become like Christ by giving his life away for Christ. And he calls us to do the same. He calls us to become like Christ by giving ourselves away in the service of Christ. A man I know who is a prominent lawyer and a Presbyterian elder captured the whole idea in what I found to be a rather unusual way. He said, I don't know why preachers don't explain to people that Christianity is basically basin theology. What? Basin theology? He was asked, what in the world is basin theology? He said... When Pontius Pilate, who possessed great earthly power, was asked to help someone, he called for a basin, and he washed his hands of the whole matter. When Jesus of Nazareth, who possessed great spiritual power, was asked to help someone, he called for a basin, and he girded himself with a towel, and he gave himself away in humble and loving service. He went on to say, Christianity is determined by which basin you choose. Is it the basin where you wash your hands of the needs and the problems of the world, or is it the basin where you try to clean up the world's needs and problems? Christianity is determined by which basin you choose. Oh, I tell you, I love that. Understand, please, becoming like Christ is not a call to pride and privilege. Rather, it is a call to sacrifice and service. It is a call to what I choose to call the nobility of humility. The nobility of 
humility. I suspect that all of us are aware of the ages-old struggle which exists between the secular humanists and the Christian theologians. That struggle is especially intense in our society right now. The secular humanists maintain that we as human beings can be and do anything that we wish to be and do. We can, by our own efforts, achieve whatever our hearts desire, and we are accountable not to God or to anyone else, but only to ourselves. The Christian theologians, however, say that apart from God, we can not be or do good in our lives. Apart from God, we are without hope in this world. And it is only to God to whom we are accountable. Now, I stand with the Christian theologians because of a whole host of really good reasons, but among those reasons is this. I will tell you, I can barely stand the arrogance, the braggadocio, the obnoxious self-centeredness of the secular humanists. Besides that, secular humanism is now the predominant pattern of thought in the academic and political worlds. And I invite you to look at the mess the world is in because of it. I stand unashamedly, unapologetically with the Christian theologians declaring that only by the power and grace of God can we become all that God intends for us to be in this life. Oh yes, there is sin in us. Yes, yes, yes. There is profound, pervasive, sometimes even perverse sin. Yes, there is sin in all of us. But the fact of the matter is God, and I believe the Bible confirms this over and over again, God sees in us what we cannot see in ourselves. God loves us with an undeserved love through Jesus Christ because God can see the possibility for magnificence in our living when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and Christ alone. That is quite clearly the call to the nobility of humility. And what is true in our lives, I hope is true in this church. You see, here at this very critical point in our life as a congregation, a time of transition, I hope and pray that everything we do here will deliver a sure and certain message to the world around us, to the people who are out there in that world. And the message is this, that they have been created by God as one of His masterpieces, that they are priceless to God, that God desires to save them through Jesus Christ for eternal life, and that they can strive to become like Christ in their everyday living. It's true for them, and it's true for us as well. And that is why, by God's grace and by God's power, for us as believing Christians, the best is yet to come. Ah, but then also, the best is yet to come for us as a believing church. Once more, the eloquence of Paul is so inspiring. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I want you to focus on those words. I press on toward the goal. That's the call to us as a church. 
I played basketball in college. One year, we had a terrible record. We lost nearly every game. And after every game that we lost, one of the fellows on that team would say to us in the locker room, well, guys, at least we did our best. I hated it when he said that. And I hate it still. Because you see, the fact of the matter is, we hadn't done our very best. And besides that, when he said what he said, he was tempting us to settle for mediocrity on the basketball court. Well, the same thing happens to us in life. We can't just say, we've done our best. Because we know better than that, don't we? I certainly could never stand up here and tell you that I've done my very best in life. No. I've failed and failed to measure up to God's standards more times than I can count. But that's not all bad. No, I, hear me clearly. I'm not suggesting that failing and not doing your best is a good thing. It isn't. But what I am saying is that the recognition of that fact the recognition that we have not yet done our best, that is the impetus to keep us moving forward and upward in the faith. To acknowledge that we have failed and we haven't measured up to God's standards is the spur that will lead us to press on toward the goal for which God is calling us. In other words, the best is yet to come. The splendid is still ahead. Oh, I love to celebrate this church. This church has been blessed by God with extraordinary leaders through the years, and this church's history has been marked by nothing less than greatness and glory. But that does not mean that this church has never experienced a measure of failure or defeat or setback or tribulation. It has, and it will. Ah, but do you remember when Jesus said, in the world you have tribulation? I wonder if you know what he was really saying there. You see, when Jesus used the word tribulation, the word that is originally used is a word which actually means the pressing of grapes for the wine. And then later on, when that word was translated into Latin, the word they used was the word for threshing, that is, the separating of the wheat from the chaff. And so Jesus is saying to us, yes, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to be pressed and threshed. You're going to be pressured and pulled apart. There will be all kinds of forces that you have to deal with in life. But what I want you to remember is that those tribulations can lead to good. In one case, they lead to the wine. In the other, to pure grain. The tribulation, you see, produces that which is good. In other words, when we encounter trials and troubles and tribulations in the church, those things are what separate the valuable from the worthless in our church. Those things are what separate the good from the not so good in the church. And out of that experience of tribulation, we as a church become stronger and better. You have tribulation, yes. But out of whatever tribulation may be yours, the best is yet to come. In 1801, when Napoleon's forces were retreating from the city of Moscow, many of the French soldiers were falling off into the deep snow and dying. The man who wrote the most detailed account of that retreat was a man whose name was the Duke of Vincenza. And in his account, he told how, as he made his way along the ranks of the troops, so many times they would see them just fall off over into the snow to sleep, even though going to sleep meant certain death in the snow. And so he would go, and he would tug on them, and he would pull them, and he would drag them up, and he would encourage them to keep moving, to keep moving ahead, because that way they could survive. And they kept pleading with him, let us alone, leave us to sleep. And he wouldn't do it. 
He kept pulling them up because he knew that if they went to sleep in the snow, they would be dead. And he wrote, I could not let them sleep. My beloved people, I cannot let us sleep either. In fact, I believe that that is one of the reasons God has called me to this place at this point in our church's history. I cannot let us sleep. Now is not the time to relax. Now is not the time to sit back. Not now. Not at this very critical transition time in the life of this great church. No. You see, the fact of the matter is, this church has not yet done its very best for Jesus Christ. This church has not yet become all that God means for her to be. And so therefore, forgetting what lies behind, we shall press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God is calling us heavenward. Yes, we shall press on. Why? Because, my beloved people, because by the grace and power of Jesus Christ, for all of us and for this magnificent church, the best is yet to come. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory, amen and amen.